welcome to this class. Today's class promises to be very, very interesting as our focus will be on figures of speech. You will be surprised why is it that I have written part one? Are there different parts of figures of speech? Well, I believe that many of you out there, or many of you here, might have heard of the expression figures of speech, or might have actually studied some of them. But permit me to start by introducing you to the conceptual definition of figures of speech. A figure of speech is a word or phrase that has a meaning other than the literal or common meaning. That is to say, it is a rhetorical device that achieves a special effect by using words in a clearly special way. We can also say by this definition that a figure of speech conveys meaning by identifying or comparing one thing to another which has connotation or meaning familiar to the audience. The figure of speech is a departure from the ordinary form of expression. Just imagine you calling somebody a pig. Does it mean that that person is a four-legged animal? No. Rather, you are creating a mental picture. That is why we conclude that figure of speech helps by bringing out a mental picture of what uh, the person or speaker is talking about. It is different from the denotative meaning or the dictionary definition of words. Because of their roles, because of what each of the figures of speech does, we are going to group the figures of speech into different categories. In my class, I have grouped them into eight. There are eight groups. And because of these eight groups, I decided to tag to this class as figures of speech part one. By the end of the class, you should be able to see the categories or the number of groups that we are able to cover. Let's look at the first one that we are trying to talk about, we say that we have group one that we may refer to as what? Figures of association. What do we mean by figures of association? What comes to our mind when we talk about figures of association? Figures of association are kinds of figures of speech that express connection between ideas. That's why I said that the express association or connection between ideas. We have different figures in this association or connection group. Let's take the first one called the transferred episodes. Transferred episodes is also known as the hyperledge. The hyperledge. That's why I wrote a hyperledge or transferred episodes. What does this mean? We are trying to find out what the figures of speech means and some examples we are going to use practically. So in all the figures of speech we are going to talk about today, we are going to see this format we have on the screen. What you should know and examples. Let's look at the hyperledge or transferred epithet. We say that it is a figure of speech where the order of word structure is reversed, showing the relationship between two words. Here, we say an adjective is transferred from animate to inanimate. In transferred epithets, a modifier such as adjective is applied to the wrong word, I use wrong in quotation, in the sentence. Hyperledge often creates metaphor, or should I say sometimes creates metaphor. Look at some of the transferred epithets in these sentences. He danced the happy road home. What is actually happy? Is it the road or the subject he? It is he that is happy, not the road. So you can see that it is transferred. The hyperledge is moved from he to where? Road. That is why we have happy as a modifier, uh, modifying or qualifying road. Let's take a look at another one. We have this is a male entrance. When does entrance start to have male uh, gender, so to say? Do we have female entrance as? Uh, what we call it as a gender? No, we can see that this entrance belongs to male, this entrance belongs to female. So male here is serving as a modifier or qualifier, qualifying entrance. 
entrants also have gender. The third example of this category is a careless remark made by the former principal made him to leave the institution. Or in other words, a careless remark made the former principal to leave the institution. What is careless? Is it the remark or the principle? So we say that someone can be careless, not a remark. Thus, the epithet is transferred from the principle to what? Excellence. Remark. That's why we have careless remark as underlined. We have talked about transferred epithets. Don't forget that. Let's go to the second one. Remember, we are still on group one, figures of association or connection. So, we have talked about transferred epithets. Let's go to the second one we'll talk about here. We call it metonymy. As it is, metonymy is a figure of speech in which a particular expression that is used to refer to something is changed or modified. That is, a concept that is used to address a particular idea will not be used, but rather what is associated with. That is why on the screen I say a figure of speech in which a thing or concept is not addressed by its own name, but by the name of something associated with it. Let's look at some examples before we throw some other highlights to this uh, category. Look at these uh, examples. Example one, we are going to study Shakespeare in grade 12. Are we actually going to study Shakespeare or Shakespeare uh, plays? Definitely we are studying Shakespeare plays, not Shakespeare. So we call it metonymy because Shakespeare is actually what is uh, common in that category. Look at the second one. The pen is mightier than the sword. The pen is mightier than the sword. Do we see that? The pen is associated with education or knowledge. Why the sword is associated with what? War. So we can say it is a, a metonymy. Look at this third one. The skirts have taken over the streets of Lagos. Who are those that we know skirts by? We know girls by their wearing of what? Skirts. So instead of saying skirts, have take, uh, girls have taken over, we now say skirts have taken over the streets of Lagos. Do we get that? It's metonymy. The scepter shall not depart from the tribe of Judah. That's kingship, rulership. It's metonymy. So we we'll look up for more examples on this and do research on them. Remember, we said that it's a figure of speech in which a thing or concept is not called by its own name, but by the name of something associated with that thing or concept. The third one is titled Synedoki. What is Synedoki? Synedoki is a figure of speech in which a part of something is used to represent the whole or the whole of something is used to represent part of it. When you use a part to represent a whole or a whole to represent a part, we call it synedoki. Look at some beautiful examples. Our school needs a lot of hands to cater for the many students we have. A lot of hands. Do you see that? Is it hands that the school need or members of staff, workers, teachers, and others? You got it. So using hands to represent teachers or members of staff, we say it is a synedoke. Hands representing a whole of human being. That is synedoke. Look at the second one. Gray hairs are not needed in Nigeria politics. Gray hairs represent who? Old people. They are the ones that have gray hairs. We have a Nigeria won the match against Togo. Nigeria won the match against Togo. Are you a Nigerian? If you are a Nigerian, did you play in the match? So why should we say Nigeria won the match? You can see that we are using a whole to represent a part. That is uh, the players that played the match. The hands that took my pen must surely return the pen. Is it hands that took your pen or human? So it is a person or human that took your pen that should return it. This is why we call it synedoke. Using a part to represent a whole or a whole to represent a part. So far, we have talked about figures of association. We made reference to transferred epithets. We talked about metonymy. We talked about synedoke. This period, we want to switch to another group, group two, that is titled 
figures of construction. What do we mean by figures of construction? Figures of construction are used to show rhetorical use of words to achieve artistic purpose. In other words, rhetorical use of words are used to achieve artistic or literary purposes, the purpose of which we intend to speak or write. There are many figures of speech in this category, and I will just break out a few of them that are very common in our day-to-day -day use of words and in books. Let's look at this, the first one. We call it anaphora. 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 Anaphora is a repetition of a similar words or expression at the beginning of successive phrases, clauses, sentences, or verses, especially for poetic effects. So when we say that there is a repetition of word, whether expression could be a phrase or a clause, once it is repeated for the Purpose of poetic uh, artistic write-up, we say it's a uh, anaphora. Look at some of the examples I've given you here. The examples I've given you here are one, mind word, mind kings, mind composition. What word is repeated? Mind. So we have mind word, mind kings, mind composition. The second one we have I came, I saw, I conquered. Yes, this is William Shakespeare's expression. I came, I saw, I conquered. It's made by Julius Caesar in one of Shakespeare's work. You can see that they are actually showing repeated words as in I, I, I. Look at this third one I will give you. With malice towards none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right, with repeated for emphasis and for poetic effect. That is exactly why we call it an aphora. We have another one we are going to pay attention to here. Number two, under figures of construction. This second one is called antimetabole. Some people pronounce it as antimetabole, but it's pronounced as antimetabole. Just as we have hyperbole, not hyperbole. I don't know why. You can also call it hyperbole, the usual form, but the original pronunciation is hyperbole. We have anti-metabole. When we get to hyperbole, we talk about it. And this uh, category, let's look at this expression, anti-metabole. What does it mean? What does it refer to when we say something is anti-metabole or anti-metabolic expression? This is the repetition of clause with reverse wording in the second clause. Remember the previous one, anaphora, is a repetition of word clause, okay? But this one, is reverse form. We say that uh, in antimetabole, when the first clause is spoken, it may not be particularly noticeable. However, when the second clause is given, the repetition is immediately noticed. This is made for emphasis sake. Yes. A reverse wording we have, we eat to live, not live to eat. If we just write, we eat to live, would it, would it make sense? No. Now we have written, we eat to live, not live to eat. The antimetabolic expression is there now. Repetition of clause with reverse wording to create a meaning. Yes, anyone that hears this, that it is literally, we eat to live, not live to eat. The second one is, it is not even the beginning of the end, but is perhaps the end of the beginning. It is not even the beginning of the end, but it's perhaps the end of the beginning. We can see in the reverse order, beginning is used there, that in reverse order to show the artistic uh, expression. Ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country, according to J.F. Kennedy. These are just examples of some of the expressions we are talking about in anti-metabolic expressions. Let's move to the next one, apart from antimetabole. You know, I'll give you the first one we talked about, anaphora, antimetabole, and the other one is chiasmus. Chiasmus is not actually common in the figures of speech because many a person does not actually use it. Many a person does not know what it means. But what is chiasmus? It is a verbal pattern in which the second half of an expression is balanced against the first, but with the parts reversed. Look at this example. He knowingly left and we followed blindly. His chiasmus. He knowingly left 
and we followed blindly. That is how we say that it's a verbal pattern in which the second half of an expression is balanced against the first, but with the parts reversed. Look at the second example. Fair is foul and foul is fair. Do you get that? Fair is foul and foul is fair. So study this more and get to know the reason for why we use them. Let's proceed to the next one, number four. The fourth one we want to talk about after chiasmus is inversion. What is inversion? Inversion, as the name implies, can also be referred to as anastrophe. It is a reversal of the normal order of the words or phrases in the sentence. That is why we call it inversion. It is common in poetry in which an adjective is placed after a noun it qualifies or a verb before each subject or a noun preceding each preposition. Please look at the notes on the screen. Let's read it the way it is here. This is a reversal of the normal order of the words and phrases in the sentence. Inversion is common in poetry in which an adjective is placed after a noun. It qualifies. Please, that word is it, not if. Typographical error. After a noun, it qualifies or a verb before each subject or a noun presenting its preposition. Let's proceed to the examples we have here. The fear of him did many a great man quake. Did you get the inversion here? Yes, the fear of him did many a great man quake. In that word, many great men fear him. Many great men quake because of his fear. Second example, young was he when he first sat to the throne. Young was he when he first sat on the throne. Typographical error again. Young was he when he first sat on the throne. Pay attention to that very well. He was young when he first sat, but we revert, inverted it to be what? Young was he when he first sat on the throne. We have another example here. Wakeful he lay when yet low was a song. Wakeful he lay when yet low was a song. All these are examples of inversion. And we go to the fifth one, which is called rhetorical question. What is a rhetorical question? A rhetorical question is a figure of speech that appears to be a question, but it's not really a question. But it's a statement given in the form of a question. It suggests its own answer without expecting a direct answer or reply from the reader or listener. It is not asked for information, but for effect. In other words, it is intended to make the listener agree with the speaker as the answer is obviously yes. That's why some people refer to it as a rotema. Let us look at this example as we have here. Example one. Can death kill any person? You know the answer. So because the answer is obvious, you don't have to say it. That is why we call it rhetorical question. The second one, does a baby grill? You know the answer. You know very well that you, the, the speaker knows that the expert answer is yes. Even the spoken to knows. So why give it the answer? Or why is the word this cruel? Why is the word this cruel? So all these amount to rhetorical question. So far, what have we been discussing? We have discussed what figures of speech really are, and we have learned that figures of speech are actually rhetorical devices that are used to paint our expressions to make the speech or the writing very, very literary. And I said that we have eight groups based on the function of each of the figures of speech. And all these eight groups that we have talked about, that I've been mentioned of, I just talked about two groups now. Do you remember them? Figures of association and figures of construction. Under figures of association, we talked about transpired epithets, metonymy, and synecdoche. And other figures of association of uh, construction, we talked about anaphora, antimetaboly, chiasmus, inversion, and rhetorical question, including uh, zugma, which is actually the fifth one I want to talk about now. What is zugma? Zugma is a figure of speech. That is, um, that is meant to join two or more parts of a sentence with a common word, usually a verb. Remember the journey of two or more parts of a sentence with a common word, usually a verb. Look at this example. We have, she opened the door and heart to me on my first visit. Do you see that expression? Joining two or more parts of a sentence with a common word. 
What is the verb here? Yeah. Open. She opened the door to me. She opened the heart to me on my first visit. She opened the door and heart to me on my first visit. Um, look at this one again. We have oh, my heart. Uh, I ought to have given you H E A R T. H E A R T. Please correct her heart in your notebook. She opened the door and heart. H E A R T. To me on my first visit. Example two, we have time makes older adults wiser and younger adults less wise. These are examples of Zuma. So with this, we come to the conclusion of the class today. And let's try, if possible, to do more research on this. In subject classes, I will give you part two of figures of speech. By then, we shall focus our attention on figures of contrast and figures of imagination. Oh, I have a different example here. The tank fire and then bridge many hopes. Uh, the tank fire and then bridge and the bridge and many hopes. Uh, sorry, tank error again. The tank fire and the bridge and many hopes. Sank. The tank fired and the bridge and many hopes. Sank. So this is how we come to the end of this class. Feel free to uh, let the comment box to roll. Let it be. Boggy or send your message straight to the waza. If you have actually enjoyed the video, if possible, just pay attention to your subscription button and click on the notification button. When you do, whenever we post our video on a class like this, you will receive a notification. This is about J O.